Steph Green was nominated for an Emmy for directing the episode of Watchmen called Little Fear of Lightning. I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Steph now. And this was your first Emmy nomination, but you also got to share it in your category with Nicole Castle and Stephen Williams also getting nominated for their episodes. Uh, what was that Emmy nomination morning like for you? Just seeing how well the show did, but also, you know, for yourself getting your first nomination. Uh, completely uh, surprising and magnificent. And uh, actually, it, actually, Nikki got to me before I was able to find my nomination. So Nicole actually texted me, Steph, in all caps with exclamation marks. And then I sort of found that I had been nominated and, and I definitely, um, I yelped with uh, excitement because it, re it really was a surprise. You know, Nikki and Steven's episodes are so fantastic to share the nomination with them is such an honor. Um, so it's really, really great news. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to the beginning here. What were you sort of drawn to about Watchmen to to get involved? Did you have a history of the comic or the movie or? Um, I I did know the comic, um, the book, the graphic novel, not not well, but well enough to know and respect it and enjoy it. And I have a brother in law who's obsessed with it and reads it every year and kind of had had brought me into the epic uh, mythic nature of this of this uh, work of art and i love damon's work uh, that really the fact that damon was doing it and then of course that nicole uh, was getting involved who is a colleague and friend and i'm a great admirer of her work so knowing that nicole and damon would be setting the tone i just of course i wanted an hbo um, supporting the breadth of the production and then you started then i started to hear about cast members i mean you know it was just sort of an irresistible package. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and for those who don't remember, uh, Little Fear of Lightning is the episode that's centered on Tim Blake Nelson's character, Wade. Um, it begins with a flashback to a younger Wade in New Jersey, and it sort of feels like a classic horror movie in a way, where um, he's a Jehovah's Witness, and he's been lured into this fun house by a girl, and it's, it's so tense you know, and then he's humiliated and then he comes out and sees that this giant squid attack has happened. Um, so what were some of the challenges of executing that big opening sequence? Um, I mean, you can just imagine reading that first, that teaser in the script, first of all, my heart just started beating really fast because it's just such an incredible sequence to uh, be able to design and the team was so excited and we were all just so kind of, and the amount of meetings we had about just that opening sequence, I probably, I couldn't count them. Um, we, we immediately started studying the graphic novel for the imagery of the, of after the squid attack and really seeing kind of the fun we could have um, hiding Easter eggs and then just being inspired by the graphic novel. Um, very complex to design the mirror uh, the, the mirror maze. And um, though some of the shattering of the mirror maze had visual effects, absolutely none of the trickery of the mirrors was visual effects. So Javier Grobe, who's also nominated, um, did so much incredible work to try to plan how we would hide our camera in this mirror maze, which often meant that we were behind a one-way mirror. So we, could, we were behind one of those mirrors with our, with our team uh, looking out and and the actor could look directly at us and just see a mirror. And that would help with the, with the rep, reflections and um, replications. So, I mean, each part of it, and then we sort of took over a street. We were in um, Atlanta, Georgia, creating Hoboken, 1985. So um, lots of inspirational imagery, you know, from the little details of like the elephant do donut, donut creations at those fairs all the way to you know, the particular Ferris wheels and uh, games that would have been there at the time, the costumes. But what was so fun is we really could pull from the graphic novels, 1985. And there's all kinds of little Easter eggs in there. Um, we then used a spider cam. I mean, I could talk for probably too long about this sequence, but we used a spider cam, which is a camera on a, on a um, kind of a zip line to pull back and away from our main character as he was screaming and to take in all that destruction and uh, death at the fair. And then as you see, as you continue with the camera and sort of move past the Ferris wheel, that's when we got into some VFX work um, with an incredible team. Uh, and it's, it's, it's the actual distance from uh, 
this sort of exact place in Times Square that the squid was dropped. So we move through New York visually, you know, with visual effects, and then we finally land on the squid. So um, it was a fantastic sequence to create. And, and Philip um, Labes, who plays young Wade, was just such a collaborator, wonderful actor, um, you know, studied Tim Blake Nelson's accent that he was using so that he could mimic it, um, was so courageous and vulnerable uh, to be in a scene like that. Um, how it was a freezing cold night in Atlanta, standing in the middle of the street, screaming, um, and all those hundreds of extras lying on the cold, cold ground being dead as we sprinkled blood all over them. So it was quite an experience. I think as a crew, we really came together and worked hard, and, but the result is so thrilling. Yeah, it's it's really incredible. One of the most memorable sequences, I think, from the whole miniseries. Um, and the episode also uh, plays around a lot with alternative history, alternate history aspect of things. We see the the video that's a recruitment tool to get people to come back to New York. And that sort of feels like an analog for 9-11. There's this mention of a Steven Spielberg movie called Pale Horse, which is clearly supposed to be like Schindler's List. Uh, we, we also see a lot of screens and uh, media, you know, stuff like that. Can you talk about sort of the thematic through line that you were trying to sort of execute with this episode? Um, sure. Well, well, I think that those thematics ran through the series of, you know, pro the, the power of propaganda, right, from the very, from the first episode, um, throughout. And uh, yeah, for, for us, you know, it was very fun that Wade was a market researcher uh, by day. And, you know, by in his uh, police identity, he used the big pod and had all those screens going. And then he looked into the eyes of, of you know, who he thought was Seventh Cavalry and, and was able to read the truth. Um, and similarly, in his day job, he used that you know, that same skill. Now, I think so part of what's interesting is that he was able to see that those people were lying, but then he's also been himself a victim of this big lie. So I think all this deception and these layers of, of betrayal and deception are, are such a, um, Damon is just such a master of that kind of storytelling, you know, that ultimately in, in, our, in, in my episode, in our episode, Wade is betrayed and he's betrayed and he also will betray Angela. Um, and I think that all the, all the media, just to circle back to that, is just another way we manipulate uh, each other. And I think this is a huge theme for Damon throughout and, and a big part of Wade's story as well. Yeah, for sure. And, and with Tim Blake Nelson taking the lead here, I have to admit I was a bit shocked to not see him among the nominations here because Right. I mean, he's so impactful. It's gut wrenching, to be honest. I really, um, yeah. I really feel he deserved a nomination. I mean, I mean, there were so many incredible performances, um, but this he this was like making a film with him. And I I feel like what I what we got to see from him was just incredible. Um, so I I share your feelings. I'm glad you. <laughs> yeah. That. Um, well, what were kind of the discussions you were having with him on set to just carry this whole episode? Um, you know, Tim is such a, uh, he's such a brilliant man and performer, and he brings so much pain, you know, if it's needed to the role, to the screen. And he, he carries that in a way that I think one thing Damon said that I, I'm going to, I'm going to not, you know, articulate as well as Damon did, but we, you know, we had to make this very, uh, this sort of uh, crazy thing of this squid attack become very personal, very emotional, and um, take on a real uh, a real depth and trauma. And who better than Tim Blake Nelson for us to feel that through? Um, so uh, you know, with Tim, we got to to tell a love story, um, a, a man who had had such trouble trusting. And loving was going to have this this chance and we were all going to root for it then he was going to be you know betrayed and have his heart kind of broken but he can't sit in the heartbreak for too long because he has to go basically then be in a sort of third act that's a thriller um and a and a, and a big reveal and he becomes like the guy with the gun that's got to go hunt down the bad guys um 
So, so I think we, um, we just were, were journeying together, making sure we were always tonally in the right part of the story, you know, because you shoot, you shoot out of order, but he had such a fantastic arc, um, start to finish. And I, and I think, um, you know, he had already realized Wade to a degree, but this was all new information for him too, as an actor to work with. So it was really fun just watching him take in and work with these layers that Damon was giving him to play with. And he just was just excellent. And I, I'm really, um, I really share the nomination with him, truly. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, watching the episode again this week, I, I noticed such a strong use of music in this episode, um, especially the song Careless Whisper, which we hear throughout the episode, which is quite haunting at times. Um, so what was the inspiration to have that as a kind of repeating motif throughout the episode? You know what? I have to be totally honest that I was, that Carly Ray. we got to ask Carly Ray and Damon because that was one yeah. of their, and Atticus and the designers, because that was one of their, they, they I, once I heard it, I was like, yes, this is working. But I have to be honest that they would, they would have to tell me uh, there, and I'm sure it's online. So I apologize, I'm not, I don't know the answer to that. I don't remember from a year ago, but I'm, but we can find it. Quick, quick, we'll Google it after. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, there's also this segment in the episode with Adrian Veidt, with him being catapulted onto Europa. Um, and it's such a, a funny segment with how he's eventually just yanked back to his little <laughs> Downton Abbey-esque prison. <laughs> um, what was that whole sequence like to film? <laughs> Again, like such a privilege to plan such a, an elaborate sequence that had to be this um, careful marriage of stunts, set design, and VFX. Um, and then, you know, we had Jeremy Irons, the unbelievable, unbelievable ta talent, um, who we were constricting in this incredibly heavy suit. Um, you know, this, in, this, this amazing creation by Megan Kasperlick, the, co the costume designer. Um, so, uh, lots of pre-visualization, uh, lots of practice. We had, you know, uh, Jeremy doing a lot of work on a, on a sort of 360 green screen so that we could put in Jupiter and put in, uh, you know, the surface of Europa. We had, um, we had a, a frozen versions of our corpses and then we had to, and then we had a lot of plastic dummies that were then detailed in, in VFX. I think that the, the part you described, um, both the landing and the yanking back were really fun to figure out. We, we basically, we yanked a stunt performer quite hard with, uh, with a, you know, he, he kind of jumped back and we yanked him. And then on the flip side, back in Downton Abbey land, as you say, we, um, we dragged him through the forest, um, sort, of, sort of having him jump off a platform so it looked like he was jumping through this, the um, transitional space. And then we pulled him through. And then as he like rolled uncomfortably to a sitting position, that of course was, was Jeremy, um, who was very uh, flexible and strong and could, could actually do a lot of the stunts. I was, I was so impressed. Um, and, he, and, and Jeremy kind of rolled up and dusted himself off and, and he had landed back home. But it was certainly so fun to, to design and and figure out. Yeah, uh, it's been fun talking to a lot of the people involved with Watchmen this year, just because it's somehow become more relevant than it was when it aired last year, just because of how it depicts police brutality and whitewashing of history. And um, talking to Jean Smart, she pointed out this whole idea of wearing masks even, like oh, so many great. parallels. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I so, asked him. Uh, what, I asked him to try to tell the future, like what's going to happen next, because he obviously is about right? a year ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what's kind of your take on how the show has managed to resonate even more now than it did when it aired? You know, I'm just so you know, Damon decided to go. I mean, he decided to tell the story of the Tul Tulsa massacre with every resource we could find. And that, um, this was before any of this be it being in the news. And just the fact that he ran with these ideas that he was, he was working with in a very personal way. Um, 
trauma and race relations. And he, he very quite fearlessly, and I remember, ta- you know, Regina talking about it too, that, that, that um, we're going to put on the screen thing, something that is factual history that no one, not enough people know about, an, an, an abhorrently small number of people know about. So I, I think it's really, um, I just feel so grateful to have worked with uh, a true, truly an artist who, who was able to manifest so much of what was going on before it was in the zeitgeist, before it was in the national, more of the national conversation, the international conversation. Um, and, and he's not just able, you know, we're not just, he talks about race relations, uh, or we're, we're, we're looking at all those themes and, but we're also looking at even for Wade, um, that this trauma is intergenerational, that we pass down how we're, how we're treated and what happens to us, to our, our children. Um, and I think that the, these concepts are, don't just kind of go, kind of expose what we already know or what we should know, but they also go deep into the psychological, that we're, our interior lives and therefore how we organize our exterior lives are affected by, by trauma. And, you know, I, I remember in one of his interviews, Damon said like, you know, nostalgia isn't nice for everyone. Looking back is not the same for every person. And um, he, he was just thinking about these things ahead of, ahead of all of us. It's really astonishing. Um, okay. And I also, to bring it full circle a bit, I wanted to go back to a little over a decade ago where you were actually nominated for an Oscar for your short film, New Boy. Um, what are your memories of that night, just attending the Oscars and getting that kind of recognition on that level? Oh, um, it, was a, it was amazing. I had been living in Ireland and um, the star of my movie was um, Tunji uh, Obun Cole, and he is um, an actor that had, you know, done I think one or two tiny bit parts, and then he got sort of my, the lead in my short, and we made this little short. And he had never been to the U.S. He had never been to L.A. Um, he wore, he had his like gorgeous tux on, and he was my date, and um, we were both just starry eyed and. And thrilled and and nervous. I remember. Um, so uh, yeah, it was it was a thrill. I'm sorry, I'm not really. I don't know if I'm answering the question. I, I it was it was a time. You know, I I will point out that that movie in Ireland was made because there was um, new cultural understanding happening there because the the Ireland had gone from a country that everyone looked like me pretty much to um, a lot of immigration and a lot of change. And that movie was about um, racial tension in its own way. Um, and I know, I know that um, part of what resonated was, te- was telling stories for people that were not represented at that time in Ireland. Um, and those, those, those needed perspectives that I now feel like we're finally uh, talking about and really prioritizing. So it was great. It was really a thrill. Yeah. And maybe it can resonate even more now, a decade later. I've noticed that more people are finding it online. I think it's in some curriculum, um, teaching curriculum, actually. So, yeah, I mean, it has its, you know, it's not a perfect film, but it, but um, yeah, it's certainly fun to have. 10 years ago uh, was the recession Oscars. And we were told, oh, you're, you know, it's going to be a little different this year because it's 2009 and we're in a recession. So the Oscars is actually going to work a bit differently. And now I'm now the COVID Emmy. So I feel like my, maybe my awards will line up with significant moments. There you go. Significant (laughs) world history moments. Yes. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, Steph, for talking to us today and congrats again on your Emmy nomination. Best of luck for whatever virtual ceremony we get. I know. I know I'm getting my best pajamas ready. There you go. Yeah. And for those of you watching, hit like and subscribe for more interviews with Emmy nominees and head to goldderby.com to make your winner predictions. Mm-hmm.